Dear colleagues, welcome in today's first session on pediatric dermatology. We are proud to offer you a nice and varied program. The topics that will be covered are mastocytosis, atopic dermatitis and the atopy syndrome, and dermoscopy in children. During these presentations, you can submit questions and these will be asked verbally at the end of the session. But let's start now with the first presentation, which will be given by myself. And my topic for today is mastocytosis. Mastocytosis refers to a heterogeneous group of clinical disorders characterized by an abnormal accumulation of mast cells. The skin is the organ most frequently involved, but all organs may be affected. Mastocytosis may occur at any age, but the onset is usually before the age of two years. The prevalence is about nine cases per 100,000 inhabitants, and the male to female ratio is about 1.4. The, the occurrence is usually sporadic, but familial cases have been reported. And the symptoms are due to the release of mast cell mediators or due to organ impairment. The updated World Health Organization classification defines three major categories, being cutaneous mastocytosis, systemic mastocytosis, which is further subdivided into indolent systemic mastocytosis, smoldering systemic mastocytosis, systemic mastocytosis with an associated hematologic neoplasm, aggressive systemic mastocytosis, and mast cell leukemia. And then there's a third rare category being mast cell sarcoma. However, some comments can be made on this classification. As all forms of mastocytosis originate in the bone marrow, at least conceptually, mastocytosis could be considered a systemic disorder in all cases. And as bone marrow studies are not routinely performed nor recommended in children, at least theoretically, systemic mastocytosis can't be excluded in most children with mastocytosis. And from a dermatologic perspective, Several distinct classifications have been developed, but none of them correlates lesion type with prognosis. So the ideal classification is not yet attained. For daily practice, a simplified classification of childhood mastocytosis can be used, distinguishing cutaneous mastocytosis when the skin is the only organ involved, systemic mastocytosis when at least two organs are involved, and then mast cell leukemia, which is very rare. Cutaneous mastocytosis can further arbitrarily subdivide it into mastocytomas of the skin, when no more than five localized skin lesions can be seen, into maculopapular cutaneous mastocytosis, if more than five localized skin lesions are present, and in diffuse cutaneous mastocytosis, when the skin is diffusely involved. Systemic mastocytosis can occur with, but also without skin lesions. In cutaneous mastocytosis, skin involvement can be limited to a single or to a few lesions and can be very discreet. However, in most children, multiple yellow, brown macules and papules can be seen. And in some children, there is diffuse skin involvement. Here we see a child with diffuse red-brown macules and indurated placas. Especially in neonates, mastocytosis can present as a blistering disorder and mimic staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. Here we see two other children with mastocytosis, diffuse skin involvement and blister formation. This is another child with diffuse skin involvement, this time with infiltrative subcutaneous nodules. The diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis is based on criteria, and these diagnostic criteria include one major SM criterion being the presence of multifocal dense infiltrates of mast cells in the bone marrow or in other extracutaneous organs, 
and four minor criteria being the presence in, of mast cells in bone marrow or other extracutaneous organs showing an abnormal spindle shaped morphology. The presence of a secret mutation at codon 816 in extracutaneous organs. Kit positive mast cells in the bone marrow or in other extracutaneous organs expressing CD2 or CD25 and a serum triptase level higher than 20 nanogram per milliliter. The diagnosis of systemic mastocytosis is established if at least one major and one minor or at least three minor criteria are fulfilled. The symptoms of systemic mastocytosis are due to the release of mast cell mediators and their metabolites. They can vary and can be intermittent and they can be organ specific or not. Possible clinical presentations are some general symptoms, some cardiovascular symptoms going up to shock, some gastrointestinal symptoms, bone pain and dyspnea, and some neurological symptoms. All cases of mastocytosis have in common that there is a clustering of mast cells in various organs. And in some disease variants, increased proliferative capacity of mast cells and their progenitors is seen. A major role is played by secret mutations and by the abnormal expression of cell surface adhesion antigens, such as CD25, on the cell wall of neoplastic mast cells. However, additional mechanisms and molecular defects are responsible for disease progression, but I will tell you more about it later on. I've mentioned already secret mutations. Human secret is a proto-oncogene that encodes the KIT protein. And the KIT protein is a transmembrane tyrosine kinase that serves as the receptor for stem cell factor. The KIT protein is expressed in the stem cells, the progenitor cells of several organs, and plays an important role in several biological processes, such as cellular migration, survival, proliferation and differentiation, and in several physiological functions. Here we see a schematic representation of the KIT protein. We have an extracellular domain, a transmembranous domain, a juxtamembranous domain, and a tyrosine kinase domain. Binding of stem cell factor by the extracellular domain of two adjacent KIT proteins results in an activation of the intrinsic tyrosine kinase activity of these KIT proteins. And this results in the activation of several downstream pathways, all of them with their own major biological effect. In adults with mastocytosis, several secret mutations have been observed, with D816V being the most frequent one. D816V is a point mutation at codon 816 on exon 17. And this mutation results in a constitutive activation of the KIT protein. This means that the KIT protein remains activated, whether or not it is bound by stem cell factor. And this mutation can be found in more than 90% of the adults with systemic mastocytosis. Such a ligand independent activation of the KIT protein results in an increased mast cell proliferation and survival, in an increased mast cell degranulation, and in an altered mast cell migration and adhesion. However, additional secret and dependent mechanisms and molecular defects, for example, in the RAS gene or the STAT gene, are responsible for disease progression. And nowadays, we also know that some epigenetic changes may affect the clinical outcome as well. Until recently, CKIT mutations were found only in a minority of children with mastocytosis. But as you can see, most studies focused on codon 816 and included only a few children. In 2010, Christine Bodemer and colleagues analyzed the entire secret sequence from cutaneous biopsies in 50 children with mastocytosis. And they found secret mutations in 86% of them. 
42% inside exon 17, but also 44% outside exon 17. And so they concluded that pediatric mastocytosis, as well as adult onset mastocytosis, is a clonal disease most commonly associated with activating secret mutations. And nowadays, the search for some more and new mutations is still going on. And not only somatic mutations, but also some germline mutations have been found in childhood mastocytosis. When we compare the secret mutations found in childhood mastocytosis with those found in adult mastocytosis or adult onset mastocytosis, then we see some striking differences. Mutations inside codon 816 were found in 69% of adult onset mastocytosis and only in 39% of childhood mastocytosis. On the other hand, other mutations, mainly mutations in exon 8 and 9, were found in 46% of childhood mastocytosis and only in 3% of adult onset mastocytosis. These differences in secret mutations might be a possible explanation for the divergent clinical behavior with adult onset mastocytosis being more persisting and childhood mastocytosis being more regressing. The diagnosis of mastocytosis and the exact delineation of the subtype is based on a careful history and clinical examination on skin and bone marrow biopsy, on bone marrow smear and peripheral blood smear, and on serum tryptase level measurement. I've mentioned already the symptoms of mast cell mediator release. We've seen already some pictures of cutaneous involvement. Darius sign refers to the urtication and the erythematous halo resulting from rubbing of lesional skin. Here we see another positive Darius sign. As for dermoscopy, four different patterns can be seen, but these patterns are not specific and have no prognostic value. Apart from histology, immunohistochemistry and mutation analysis has become very important. As for immunohistochemistry, antibodies against tryptase, the kit protein and CD25 are used. And more recently, kit D816V mutation analysis of peripheral blood leukocytes has been introduced as a diagnostic test in adult onset mastocytosis. Maybe in the near future, similar tests will be introduced for childhood mastocytosis, in which, however, many different and mainly other mutations than Kit D816V are responsible. So we come to a diagnostic algorithm, an algorithm that can be used in the diagnosis of mastocytosis. If you have a child with typical skin lesions, the diagnosis of mastocytosis in the skin can readily be made. If you have a child with atypical skin lesions with a positive Darius sign, in the absence of other skin diseases, after other skin diseases have been excluded, then the putative diagnosis of mastocytosis in the skin should be confirmed by histology, by tryptase immunohistochemistry, and if necessary, by secret mutation analysis of lesional skin. And then the next question that arises is, is the skin the only organ involved or are more organs involved? In other words, do we have to do with cutaneous mastocytosis or with systemic mastocytosis? In children with lesions due to mastocytosis, mastocytosis in the skin, with the tryptase level lower than 20 nanogram per milliliter, and the absence of other signs of systemic disease, for example, organomegaly, the diagnosis of cutaneous mastocytosis can be readily made. If you have children with mastocytosis in the skin, a tryptase level between 20 and 100 nanogram per milliliter, in the absence of other signs of systemic disease, 
The provisional diagnosis of mastocytosis in the skin can be kept until adolescence. And if at that moment skin lesions are still there or tryptase level is still elevated, then a complete staging should be performed. A complete staging should also be performed in all adults with mastocytosis in the skin and in all children with mastocytosis in the skin and a tryptase level higher than 100 nanogram per milliliter or in the presence of signs of systemic disease. As already mentioned, systemic mastocytosis may occur without skin lesions. And then this can be a challenge for the physician and often the diagnosis is delayed. Clinical, suggest, uh, clinical conditions suggesting systemic mastocytosis without skin lesions are unexplained anaphylaxis, osteopathy, neurological or constitutional symptoms, chronic diarrhea or ulcerative intestinal disease, and some endocrinological syndromes. Scoring systems have been developed in order to evaluate the extent, the severity of mastocytosis and also the evolution. And the SCORMA index is such a useful, useful tool for daily practice. Another scoring system is the master score form, which is more extensive and which was developed by the year 2005 working group on mastocytosis. You can expect clinical regression in two thirds of the patient this occurs and stabilization in one third of the cases of childhood mastocytosis. Solitary mastocytomas usually resolve before adulthood and in maculopapular cutaneous mastocytosis, a partial regression is often seen within three years after onset, even while lesion may, lesions may continue to increase initially, in, increase in number and in magnitude. Persistence occurs in 30 to 50% of the cases and in 10% of the children in which the first manifestations appear after the age of five years, you can see the development of systemic mastocytosis. Diffuse cutaneous mastocytosis with onset before the age of five years carries the same good prognosis as maculopapular cutaneous mastocytosis and blistering usually disappears by the age of one to three years and 90% of them are free of symptoms by puberty. Systemic mastocytosis with childhood onset tends to persist in adulthood, but the association or development of malignancy is rare. Here we see a baby with an initial increase in number of lesions during the first four months. Here we see another child we were following or we are following. We see a partial improvement over the years but not a complete clearance of the lesions. This is the child with the infiltrative subcutaneous nodules. We see a partial improvement, but not a disappearance of all lesions. And the same is true for this child with blister formation at the beginning. Overall survival is worse in indolent systemic mastocytosis when compared to cutaneous mastocytosis and is even worse in other forms of systemic mastocytosis compared to indolent systemic mastocytosis. And for systemic mastocytosis, several prognostic scoring systems have been developed. So we come to the treatment of mastocytosis. As there is no curative therapy, treatment is directed at the alleviation of symptoms. The treatment must be tailored to the symptom complex of the individual patient and treatment strategies can be divided into anti-mediator therapy and cytoreductive therapy. It's important to realize that treatment recommendations are based mostly on expert opinion rather than being evidence-based. In patients with no symptoms, no active treatment is required. And then therapy can be limited to reassurance of the patient and the parents and a comprehensive information of the patient or relatives concerning prognosis, risks and prevention and avoidance of trigger factors. In patients with symptoms due to mast cell mediator release, 
Whatever the symptom complex, treatment starts with the avoidance of factors known to stimulate mast cell degranulation, which are, for example, the intake of some drugs, some foods, the contact with some bacterial toxins, snake and hymenoptera venoms, or biological polypeptides, and the exposure to some physical and immunological stimuli, as well as stress. The next step in the treatment is the administration of an anti-mediator drug. And the drug of choice depends on the symptom complex. For general symptoms, such as pruritus and flushing, the H1 antihistamines are still the mainstay of treatment. And if this is not enough, you can add an H2 antihistamine. Alternatives that have proven to be effective in some patients are oral sodium chromolin or oral montelukast or subcutaneous administration of omalizumab. Omalizumab is a humanized monoclonal anti-IgE antibody which was first approved for moderate to severe persistent allergic asthma and is nowadays being used as an adjunctive treatment in mastocytosis. And we, here we see the percentage of improvement on diverse mast cell mediator related symptom complexes while using omalizumab. You see there is a major improvement in many symptom complexes. Patients with symptomatic skin lesions may benefit of additional therapy on top of the H1 antihistamines. For isolated mastocytomas, a topical corticosteroid or topical pimicrolimus can be chosen. And if this fails in extraordinary situations, excision in total can be considered. For widespread lesions, of course, only in adolescents and adults, PUVA can be used or you can go for subcutaneous administration of omalizumab. And for brulé, local care and prevention of infection is important. Patients with gastrointestinal symptoms may benefit from an H2 antihistamine on top of the H1. And for hyperacidity or ulceration, you can go for a proton pump inhibitor. For diarrhea, you can go for oral sodium chromolin. And patients with severe malabsorption may need oral prednisone. For severe neuropsychiatric symptoms, high doses of H1 and H2 antihistamines are used. You can go also for omalizumab or montelukast. And of course, these patients may benefit from an antidepressant and psychological support. For severe cardiovascular manifestations, you go for a high dose of H1 and H2 antihistamine and often also for corticosteroids. For recurrent hypotension and tachycardia, you can consider cytoreductive therapy and for recurrent shock, subcutaneous administration of omalizumab. For bone pain, high doses of H1 antihistamines are used. And if this fails, you can go for a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or aspirin. But as these drugs are known as histamine liberators, it's important to start this treatment in a hospital setting with a graded dosing schedule. These patients may benefit from exercise and physiotherapy and for osteoporosis, bisphosphonates, vitamin D and calcium supplements can be given. We know that patients with mastocytosis are more prone to anaphylaxis than the people in the general population. And the most common triggers are hymenoptera stings, followed by the intake of some drugs and food. The treatment consists of the treatment of the acute episode and the prevention of recurrences by long-term venom immunotherapy, avoidance of eliciting drugs, the prophylactic use of anti-mediator type drugs and epinephrine self-injector treatment for emergency situations. But what about anesthesia? Controversy exists about the risks of anesthesia in children with mastocytosis. And quite recently, several groups reviewed the literature 
and concluded that deviations from routine anesthesia techniques were not necessary as long as meticulous preparation was made to treat possible adverse events and drugs were used which cause minimal histamine release. However, our policy is slightly different. We still recommend preventive measures of narcosis in children with large or unknown disease burden, being the children with a history of anaphylaxis, with bullous skin lesions or diffuse cutaneous mastocytosis, with systemic mastocytosis or serum tryptase levels higher than 20 nanogram per milliliter. And these preventive measures include the preoperative administration of an H1 antihistamine and prednisolone. And we see now that our approach is being supported by recent papers and the literature. In patients with therapy refractory symptomatic mastocytosis and also in patients with symptoms due to mast cell burden, you can consider the use of a cytoreductive therapy. And then you have the choice between interferon alpha 2b and cladribine. Cladribine is most commonly used because of its broad therapeutic activity, but also cladribine has its own toxicities such as myelosuppression and lymphopenia. Last year, there have been major advances in molecular targeted therapy in which the drug is chosen on the basis of the underlying defect of the disease. The tyrosine kinase inhibitors, for example, have the KIT protein as their target and other drugs have other proteins of the KIT signaling pathway as their target. So in conclusion, Mastocytosis is a clonal disease in children as well as in adults with a variable clinical appearance. There's an increasing understanding of the pathogenic mechanisms, but the ideal classification correlating subtype with prognosis is not yet attained. A complete staging with bone marrow examination should be performed in all adults, but only in a minority of children. And immunohistochemistry and molecular analysis have become very important in the diagnosis and the subtyping of mastocytosis. Most patients get benefit from an anti-mediator therapy adjusted to their own complex, symptom complex, and cytoreductive and molecular targeted therapy should be considered only in symptomatic patients who are not responsive to anti-mediator therapy and in patients with aggressive mastocytosis. Thank you for your attention. So as the questions will be asked and handled and answered at the end of the session, we can move on to our next speaker, which is Professor Susanna Pasmans. Professor Pasmans has first trained as an immunologist and then as a dermatologist. She is currently professor of pediatric dermatology and working at the Erasmus MC Sofia Children's Hospital in Rotterdam. She is a board member of the ESPD and in her research, she is focusing on children with eczema and genodermatosis. So it's not surprising that her topic for today is atopic dermatitis and the atopy syndrome. Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dirk, for inviting me for this uh, presentation. Indeed, I'm working in uh, Rotterdam in the Erasmus Medical Center in the, our National Center of Pediatric Dermatology. And today we'll ta talk about atopic dermatitis, but atopic dermatitis uh, in the environment of the atopy syndrome. And we see those children in a specialized center, the Pediatric Allergology Center in Kinderhaven, which is part of the Sophia's Children's Hospital. I have some disclosures, uh, as you can see here. The aim for today is to talk with you about treatment of atopic dermatitis as you are seeing daily these patients. And probably you think I know how to treat atopic dermatitis, so there will not be the focus. Don't worry. I will talk about why we treat patient, children with atopic dermatitis, what we treat and when we should treat and how we treat. First, why? 
Maybe you can have a look at this child. She's on the photograph, she can't talk, but she, can, she tells you something with her body language. What does she tell you? She tells she has itch. And when we look at people with uh, children with atopic dermatitis, the main symptom that is important for their quality of life is itchiness. And it's in more than 90%, probably 100%. So it's also not uh, unusual that it is the main uh, diagnostic criteria, criterion and the Williams criteria, besides the family history and where the lesions are localized on the skin. Going back to another child who indeed also has itch, what is happening here when the, the child starts itching and scratching on the skin? Some of the results you already see there at the other picture. But when the child starts scratching, you get a disruption of the skin barrier. And by doing that, you get a, a mechanism that starts. Due to, to the disruption, you get a uh, skewing of the inflammation in the skin and um, some components are downregulated. And due to the scratching, you also get hyperinnervation. And then you, the child gets in this kind of circle. And here you see the hyperinnervation. So when there comes then an antigen or allergen in the skin, it will easy, it become more easier to get itch and the, the, the child starts scratching again. So looking at the topic dermatitis as a disturbance of a balanced e ecosystem, we first have the as aspect of psychosocial, so the itching. But as a child starts scratching, we have the impaired skin barrier. But there's something else happening. In children with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, about 40 to 50% has a filigrane mutation. And filigrane is important for the integrity of the skin barrier. And have been described more than 50 mutations in filigrane at the moment, as you can see part of them here. And this filigrim is really important for the integrity. It helps us to keep the water in the skin uh, by the, the osmotic uh, functioning of a natural moisturizing factor. But the whole barrier is, uh, has first the cells, the desmosomes, the corneal desmosomes, the, the fats, the proteins. So there's a whole system that gets disrupted when the child starts scratching and when there's a filigree mutation. And this is the histology of a lesional skin of a child with atopic dermatitis. And there you see the massive infiltration of the skin with the uh, inflammatory cells. And you see the disruption of the barrier due to the inflammation, you get sponchiosis. And uh, at the top, you will get, due to the scratching, this disruption of the barrier. So we now also have the impaired skin barrier due to two factors, the filigree mutation and the scratching. And as many already, already thought a long time, time, it is now proven that in people with atopic dermatitis, there's an overgrow of staph aureus, especially in the lesional skin, you see it in 70%, in 40% in the non-lesional skin, and even 60% for the nose. And we also know when there is more disease severity, there will be a more, more overgrowth of staph aureus. The question is, what is the chicken and the egg? Is it first a staph aureus or for, first the uh, disruption of the barrier and the inflammation? Maybe 
it's not only, it can be both. But we have to realize that soft aureus is not only a bacteria that can lead to an infection and that can overgrow due to the disruption of the skin, but the staph aureus also releases uh, toxins. And those toxins, like the staph aureus itself, they can induce an immune response, uh, like an antigen, but also like an allergen. So you can find IgG and IgE in the, uh, the blood. But you can also um, find cellular immunity to the staph aureus. And this leads to a more a further disruption of the skin barrier, but also leads due to the uh, induced apoptosis of the keratinocytes. And also due to the filigree mutation, you get uh, a lower pH of a, a higher pH of the uh, skin. And that also um, brings the ecosystem in disbalance. And this will be the end of the spectrum. So you, it starts with a little, little bit of overgrowth and this may be the result. And here we have a bacterial infection of the child with atopic dermatitis. And this is a situation we do not want anymore. So we have now also an altered immune system. And as a child grows older, the, ch the skin also changes. The skin uh, is, so the, the, the aspects of the skin changes. When the ch child is young, you have more uh, wet skin, but when the child comes older, you see that the lesions go to the, more to the folds of the skin, and when the child comes older, it goes also to the head and the neck, um, especially in the time of the adolescence, when they have more social contacts. But it's getting drier, the lesions, due to le lignification. So the aspects of the information change. And that's what you see here. Here you have a healthy skin, a non-lesional skin of a person with atopic dermatitis, then an acute lesional skin in which you have more a TH2 inflammation. And there you have then the more chronic lesional state, so the older children, and there you have more lignification, and there you have a more TH1, TH17 activation. And so in this picture, you see the overview of all those stages. And you see also that there will be a change in the lipid composition, depending on what kind of lesion you have, whether you have a more acute lesion or more chronic lesion. And also how the water retention will be. Because like I said, the natural moisturizing factor, for example, will decrease then due to a lower production and also due to the inflammation And now we come to when, because you'd all know the, those children, you want to treat them. They can enter your outpatient clinic and how do you get them like that? And we're all always happy when that happens because uh, it's a burden for the child and the families as you, we all know. And we do that most times with using first a, a, a barrier emollient, so to keep uh, the skin in a very good condition, an optimal condition. And when there's inflammation, you add to that the topical corticosteroids or a, a calcium neuron inhibitor. And you can increase that. And that's also, so most, when you look at uh, who is seeing what, we have to realize that 80% of the children have a, a mild uh, topic dermatitis. 15% has about a moderate atopic dermatitis and about uh, uh, 5% or maybe lower has severe atopic dermatitis. So most general practitioners, dermatologists, pediatricians will see mild atopic dermatitis and they have a feeling of success. And that's true. But there's a group of children 
who have a more severe atopic dermatitis, the group of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And then you think, okay, this is a step up approach. So we then have to give all those children systemic treatment. And that's something I would like to talk with you about. Because these are the children we are talking about, the children with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. How can we help them better? Do we forget something? What I would like to mention is that it's, we have to do a structured approach. Do we have the good diagnosis? Is the treatment optimal? And is there good compliance? And might there be comorbidity? So before going to the systemic treatments, because the reality is, it's not that when you start systemic treatment, you can help all the children. We know also from the adults that only part of the adults we help with starting systemic treatment. In the beginning, it might look like that you have a success, but uh, on the larger terms, you see that you have a, a treatment effect of about 40%, maybe 50%. So that's not that big. And our, 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 our hope was, so maybe I should mention this also, we think about going to uh, systemic treatment when you use uh, a class three potent steroids and you cannot decrease that. So our hope was on dupilumab because that blocks R4 and R13, as you can see here. But also with uh, dupilumab, we see we can help part of the patients and you have also side effects on the eyes, about 40% has eye complaints and you see also a kind of head and neck dermatitis. So the next hope will be for all the um, therapy medications that are uh, coming to us from the adults to the children, but probably the story will be the same there. So I was wondering, is that really the next step we should make? Go from when we have uh, done the potent topical steroids, should we then go to the systemic treatments? I think there should be a step in between. And that's what we, I meant was the systemic approach. The first thing we should ask ourselves, did, do we have the good diagnosis? And what's the differential diagnosis? So think about ichthyosis, seborrheic eczema, psoriasis, drug reactions, but also immune deficiencies and ectodermal dysplasia. Don't forget them, especially in those children who don't uh, react good to the treatments. So I think there should be a step in between before you go to systemic treatment. And we did that in a national study with the older study children with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis in the Netherlands that wanted to enter that study. The first thing that we saw was that uh, 65 of 69 of these patients had asthma and uh, 76 patients had rhinitis and 27 um, patients could e start eating more because they thought they had a food allergy, but they, uh, sorry, 52 could eat more because they thought they had a food allergy to something, but they didn't have. And 27 had to eat less because they had acute complaints and aphylactic reactions to that. But what I want to mention is realize that those children, they have besides the atopic dermatitis, also as might a lot of them also have asthma, rhinitis and food allergy. So it's a rather burden for them. They have to take medications for the asthma, for the um, atopic dermatitis. It's rather complex, especially when you're young and not in a very social stable situation or you are, not, that you are not having the capacity to understand all, that, all those different treatments and to integrate it, them in a good day program. And you see that uh, we call this the atopy syndrome. So it starts most times with atopic dermatitis and then the children get food allergy beside it. So I don't say that giving a diet will 
solve the food will solve the atopic dermatitis. There's no evidence for that. You have to treat that separately, due, uh, depending on the anaphylactic reactions. And after that, you see that a lot of children develop asthma and also allergic rhinitis. So how further to help these children? We asked those children because what's the difference between this group and the normal academic population? And we asked the children and the parents. And what was remarkable is that in contrast to the children with mild to moderate dermatitis, they knew how to step up and start down, step down with the topical corticosteroids. They also knew the fingertip units. But the problem, the, uh, uh, sorry, and you saw all see also that they had, uh, they know uh, how to shower, but they didn't do it always. So treatment refusal was a real problem in these ch children. And therefore, we developed the personalized integrative multidisciplinary treatment program. It's a six week program, and we had good results with that. And the idea is rather simple, but the, um, the secret is the real, that you really need to have an integrated team. So the team discusses really together about a patient, and the patient is seen the all, always or the same, same people. Six weeks program systematic evaluation of the atopic comorbidities and the atopic derm dermatitis using uh, histories, but also uh, online questionnaires. Then we asked the patient, the parents, and all the, uh, the whole multidisciplinary team to define problems, to define treatment goals. So the goals we wanted to reach in six weeks and after six months who is going to reach what goal and who is going to do what in the, in the team and the patient unit and the team members knew that. And we had a weekly short evaluation. And we had special education of, uh, also by the psychologist for adherence to treatment. And here you see the results. So all these children were difficult to treat a, a children with atopic dermatitis, and we could help 39% of the children after six weeks. So that's maybe better than a, with a systemic treatment. And after six months, we still had helped 72 patients, 72% 72 of the patients. And you have to realize that there was only digital access between the six weeks and the six months. So we think that before starting systemic treatment, we should do a systematic evaluation. And then we can help these things, children better. And you see here they are giving you a, a cabaret. They uh, manage themselves and they uh, created themselves. So I tried to show you uh, the disturbance of a balanced ecosystem, I think. So we have psychosocial aspects, we have an impaired skin barrier, we have changes in the microbiome, and we have an altered immune response, and we have a child uh, that most times also has food allergy, asthma, and rhinitis. And we have to look for each child what's the most important part. And therefore, we want to look for a more personalized treatment. And we can do that uh, was using, for example, the PIM, so the uh, personal multi integrated multidisciplinary treatments, but also to look more in detail, what's the problem in this child? Is it the accent more on this aspect, the compliance, or is it more an overgrowth of the microbiome? Is there a real disbalance of the microbiome or a more an immune disbalance? You really should, we, I think we can do that in the future. And I would like to thank you uh, for your attentions and uh, you can ask the questions uh, after the third presentation. Thank you, Susanna, for your excellent talk. As you mentioned yourself, the questions will be handled and answered at the end of the session. So we can move on to our next speaker. It's a pleasure for me to introduce to you Professor Ramon Grimald, 
Professor Grimald is Professor of Pediatric Dermatology and working at the International University of Catalonia in Barcelona. He's a former president of the ESPD and apart from his scientific qualities, he is world famous for his entertaining way of giving presentations. So today he will tell us more about dermoscopy in children. Ramon, there you go. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pity that we cannot be one in front of the other, sharing not only the scientific part of the meetings, but also the entertaining afterwards. I'll try to give an overview on what can we do with a dermoscopy, what could we do if we have one. Sometimes things are hidden, like uh, what you don't know, that young girl is hidden inside of that, and sometimes there's a long path to get to the point you'd like to arrive in life. And maybe it's worth if you can have a look to the mountains when you are walking for days or sometimes weeks. And this is myself arriving at 5,000 meter and the satisfaction when you can cross the Torum La Paz at 5-400 meters in altitude when the oxygen, it's more than half of the oxygen we usually need to breathe. But it's not about mountains that would like to talk to you, but it's about uh, the moscopy. What's the moscopy? Well, it's a type of light, we call it polarized light, that eliminates the stratum corneo, so somehow you can see inside of the skin. So if I put you some images of some moles with the moscopy, you may see, well, it looks bigger, but it also it looks different. And for making the diagnosis, we dermatologists and pediatricians can use two different ways of approach. Instant diagnosis or sometimes a reasoned diagnosis. If you see a patient like that, everyone knows the diagnosis without thinking. The diagnosis comes straight to your head without thinking at all. This is a topic, dermatitis. Or if you see common words, you don't have to think. The diagnosis is punching in your face directly without thinking. Or also within petigo, we don't need to reason to arrive to that point. Sometimes when I arrived at home, if I see my girls covered with foam, I don't have to think. I know. They are my daughters, even if they are covered in the bathroom. But in other cases, you have to think a little bit. This could be a fungal infection. This could also be an initial impetigo. This could also be a normal exam. Or in this type of case, this is a Hashimoto preschool, isteocytosis. So you cannot go with direct intuition in some cases. And if you think that you are managing a spacecraft, a difficult one, or maybe you'd like to relax yourself and think, well, the diagnosis will come to me. Sometimes it's better to use the reasoned method in order to arrive to the proper diagnosis. But let me put you an example from the other side. Imagine that I give you this description. The body has a large brown cup it has tube extending downward from the underside of the cup rather than gills, and it has a hazelnut odor. This is a very precise description. But do you have the diagnosis? Do you know what is it? Maybe you don't, but if you see the image, it's much easier. So sometimes for making the diagnosis of boletus edulis, it's better to have an image than to have a lot of information around that image. So if you do not have a dermatological intuition and the diagnosis does not come instantly to your mind, maybe you can use the reasoned method. That's what I will try to show to you in the next 25 minutes. Imagine you are in front of a mole like that and you have to decide to send it or not to the dermatologist or to send it or not to the surgeon. You can think, well, let me help you by intuition, or maybe you can use the moscopy. Well, it's up to you to decide what you think it will be more useful. Let me think if I should or not use the moscopy. Should I buy a dermatoscope? 
Me being a pediatrician, should I really buy a dermatoscope? Should I get one? Should I ask my boss to pay for it? Well, I've heard they are very expensive. Or should I ask the pharmacological industry if they are back again, sponsoring things to buy it? Or maybe should I ask Lucinda Norman to get me one? Well, you never know. There are many types of dermatoscopes. You here have uh, one which is very popular, the Derm Light 3. They are ones that can be attached to the camera. So you see many images today taken by this type of dermatoscope. They are very handy ones that can be attached to your mobile phones. Or they're extremely cheap. This one is a USB dermatoscope. It's only $20, so extremely cheap. Others are extremely expensive. This costs 9,000 euros. So it's up to you to decide. Maybe the hands of uh, this type of uh, thing that for pediatricians it's quite good. So you just need to change the top of the normal uh, devices you have in your pediatrics uh, clinic in order to change and to use it as a dermatoscope. You can see so many different types of prices. So I won't have you to push you to internet in order to try to find which one is better suits you. What can I use a dermatoscope being a pediatrician? Well, you can use them for nevi. You can use them in trying to discover melanoma. It can be very useful also for angioma and vascular malformations, also for other type of humors, for nail disease, for hair, and also it's useful if you are getting gold. So if you get some price myopia and you don't see properly, you can get closer by using the dermatoscope. And also if you want to brag a little bit in your private office, and if you want to be a little bit a better pediatric dermatologist or pediatrician, just use it to brag a little bit in your office. So should I buy a dermatoscope? Well, let me help you on your decision. It will help you indeed to distinguish between pigmented melanocytic and non-melanocytic lesions. It will also help you to distinguish between melanocytic pigmented benign or malignant. It can also give you a better approach to non-pigmented neoplastic and inflammatory lesions like Bowen, psoriasis, lichen planus or scabies. What I do use it for, I mostly use it for pigmented lesions and for hair, but I'll put you also some other examples that in some cases I have found it uh, useful. It's also magnifying glass, so it can be used for nearly everything. Uh, I remember when I started medicine that most clinical uh, doctors had this type of magnifying glasses, or you can have them more sophisticated. I remember my professor in Milano, Professor Caputo and Carlo Gilmetti, they were always having one of those on their pocket. So they were very useful to approaching them. So you can use it for everything that needs to get closer. So for pediculosis capitis, it can be quite useful. Do you know what's that? If you have a look to the dermatoscopical image, you can see the central umbilication, these are indeed molluscum contagiosum. In many cases, you don't need that. But if you get closer, it can help you a little bit understanding what you are in front of you. A detail of this typical umbilication in molluscum contagiosum, typical eczema place for molluscum. I don't know if that is exactly a word or maybe that is a molluscum. Let me get close to it and then you realize what you are in front of. You can get close also to some scalp lesions, like in this case, a nevus verrucosus. Oh, sometimes if you get too close, you cannot get the proper diagnosis. So you have to be sure what do you want to use the dermatoscope. Have a look to this dermatoscopical image. It is impossible to make diagnosis by getting too close. So this was a typical case of atopic eczema. And the diagnosis can be quite easy clinically, but it can be nearly impossible if you get too close to the patients. Also in this case, have a look to this squamation. It's not very specific. This was an infant uh, with a scaly scalp and clinically it was clear it has this type of a seborrheic dermatitis eczema. But if you get too close, you cannot see it. 
Also in this other case, you can see this peripheral squamation, this type of plaque that can lead you to many different diseases. In this case, this was an initial case of PTD disease rosea with a plaque uh, on the pubic area. This, this was the initial plaque of PTD disease rosea. So we have to decide when to use it and when not to use it in order to be useful to us. In some cases, this is extremely useful. In pyogenic granuloma, the clinical image is clear and the dermatoscopical image is also clear. So it's good to practice using dermatoscope in these cases. And also in this case, have a look how precise the dermatoscope with this delta aspect, so characteristic in scabies. Most cases of scabies are clinically clear for us, but in some cases that we have the doubt, in those cases that you have treat them and they come back to you and you are not sure if they are cured or not, and you want to be sure before giving a second um, uh, course of treatment, then it might be useful to get closer and to perform dermatoscopy in order to understand if there's still some active lesions and you still can see the Isarcoptis scapiae just under the skin looking that ugly as this one looks in here. Also, in some other cases, the clinical image can be suggestive, but if you get closer, the image can be much nicer and easy to see. Let's move a little bit into the two main points I'd like to discuss with you. We'll discuss a little bit more deep hair and also a little bit more deep on pigmented lesions. Regarding um, hair, for those of you interested, we have written an article together with a colleague of mine, Dr. Moreno, on essentials of trichoscopy. So if you'd like to receive a copy of this PDF, just please send me an email and I'll be very happy to send a copy for you. The first approach when you put a dermatoscope on the scalp of a child, it's to try to distinguish between something you're adopting. And in most cases, uh, you'll be approaching a plaque, an alopecia plaque. This is the most common approach. So when approaching an alopecic plaque, you might be in front or alopecia reata or trichotillomania or tinea capitis. In most cases, it's only these three diagnoses. There are many more diagnoses and I am a very fond of a hair problem. So uh, there's a bunch of diagnoses, but the most common ones are these three ones. And I'll try to show you how easy it is with a dermatoscope to deal with these cases that you have your doubt and you are not sure if you are in front of tinea alopecia reata or trichotillomania. In tinea, you usually see these coma-shaped aspects that are very characteristic and that you cannot see them in the other two diseases. In alopecia reata, there are different markers, but you can have yellow dots, black dots, broken hair, we call them cadaveric hair, vellus hair, and the exclamation mark sign. If you have a good eye, you can see the exclamation hairs all, all, all already with your clinical view. But with a dermatoscope, we call it trichoscopy. It's much easier. Have a look to the yellow dots. They are very characteristic and very specific. In this case, you can see also on the left a very clear sign of the exclamation mark. You can see also the black dots, very nicely seen in this image. The hair, it's broken close to the scalp. You can see this broken hair. This, in this case, the hair is broken when it's already the hair shaft, it's already out of the scalp. And you can see this vellus hair, also typical for alopecia reata. It's typical to see the inside of the plaque. And here, another nice case of exclamation mark. These are clinical findings of alopecia areata. In trichotillomania, you'll find another type of aspect. Tulip hair, hemorrhages, trichotillosis, broken hair, different level, and the rolled hair. Have a look to this broken and rolled hair in trichotillomania. They are rather characteristic. 
And I would say the most typical image you'll see in trichotillomania is this hair powder. We call it a, the dirty plaque. When you see a very clean aspect, when you see a very wide scalp, it's nearly never trichotillomania. It's mostly alopecia areata. So if you find this dirty aspect with this powder, think of trichotillomania. In this case, it's associated with a tulip. Here you can see the tulip here with the red arrows. Look how dirty this scalp looks. This is trichotillomania, the scalp powder with hemorrhages on the black arrow and this trichoptilosis. The trichoptilosis is the open end of the hair with the red arrows on this image. Have a look to the flame hair and the black dots, the flame hair on red arrows, the black dots on yellow arrows also. Uh, we said that black dots can be seen in alopecia areata, so some of the dermatoscopical or trichoscopical markers are not extremely specific, but they put together, if you put them all together, they will help you indeed to make diagnosis. Trichotillomania with V hair and rolled hair, as you can see in these very nice trichoscopical images. Let's move from the hair part to the pigmented lesions. And many of you, if you think of buying a dermatoscope, will be mostly to try to better help your patients and better decide when you have to send them to the surgeon or to the dermatologist in order to decide if you remove or not remove that lesion. We use... Uh, a way of talking and we talk about the pigmented network. The pigmented network is the projection of the red ridges you see under the skin and this projection gives a type of network that you can see with a dermatoscope. So in fact it's a way of seeing the histology of the skin without removing the skin from outside and the type of pattern you see with the network is what is really suggesting you if you have to run or not run or if you have to decide to remove or not remove that lesion. Have a look to the different networks patterns. In the lower image you can see on the left is a typical pigment network which is very yeah, suggestive of a malignancy and on the right side you see a typical pigment network. So it's very important to use the dermatoscope in many molds, use it in many nevi in order to get used to the image when you know that it's clearly a benign lesion. Put your dermatoscope so you'll get used to see what's the normal typical pigment network. Also, you can see some globules, and the globules correspond to the nests we see under the histology. So down here you have the image of the histology with the nests, and on the top you'll see the pigmented globules that are projections of the nests up, and can also help you decide when you have to send or not to send the image. You can see here the images on the dermoscopy of the globules. Uh, this is small balls, this is small globules that can be very suggestive. In the two top images, these are benign lesions. In the lower images, this is a melanoma. And we'll see now why this is a melanoma and how you will be able to decide that this is a melanoma. I will try to show you in the next uh, eight minutes uh, a system that's very useful and I think it will help you to decide when to send the patient to be removed from a mold that you don't like. It's the, called the three-point list method. It's a very simplified algorithm to decide if the lesion needs to be removed without any specific training. It's extremely useful because the sensitivity is up to 96% without training but it's not that specific. So you will not miss a melanoma and maybe you'll have some lesions removed 
or sent to a dermatologist that would not be so necessary to be sent. But it's always much better for the patient if you are more sensitive than especially in this type of approach. These are the three-point list method, uh, and we'll discuss it uh, in a short time. If you see two of these lit points, uh, you, the lesion must be removed. And the three points to remember, it's a symmetry, a typical pigment network, and the blue whitish vial. So a symmetry, a typical pigment network, and the blue whitish vial. Let's discuss a little bit about the asymmetry. It's not uh, so easy and not so immediate to know what the asymmetry means. Have a look to the image on the left. This is a very symmetric in structure, but the borders are not so symmetric. But we don't care about the borders. We care about what's inside. So the lesion on the left is not at risk. But the lesion on the right, you see that the structures are clearly asymmetric, even though the lesion is very round and well defined. So in this case, the lesion is at risk. So we would call the right lesion to be asymmetrical and the left lesion to be symmetrical, even though the borders on the left are not so symmetrical. So the one on the right at risk, the one on the left, no risk. The typical network. Well, if you see these lines that have different type of thickness, they are not very well put. Holes between the lines are not homogeneous. And this a typical network is not distributed equally in all the lesion. This is at risk. It means that there's some type of growing that should not be there. So if you see a typical network, you have 2.1 on that lesion. And if you see blue whitish color, any blue whitish vial on the lesion, it's also pointing towards a risk. So here you have the three points to remember. Let's see a bunch of lesions in order to help us decide and better understand what are we dealing with. Shall we practice a little bit? Okay, let's start. Clinically, you have this patient. It looks clinically very easy. No one will doubt this is a known risky lesion. Let's have a look to the dermatoscopy. It looks exactly the same as it looks from outside. So there's a symmetry, no. There's a strange network, no. There's a blue whitish vial, no. So not at all, this was a normal nevus, nothing to be done. Another clinical aspect with a normal looking nevi under the dermatoscope. Well, here there's something a little bit different. Let's have a look. We see a little bit of asymmetry. It's right. We see a little bit of different aspects of the network. This is correct. We don't see any bluish whitish vial. So this should be sent to the dermatologist or to the surgeon and it was removed and it was a typical nevi. This lesion clinically looks awful. It was a young adolescent, the image is not like, is not nice at all. And if you get closer to one point of the lesion, you already see very clear this color that we haven't seen it before. So you see the blue whitish vial, you see a total asymmetry and you see that the network is totally irregular. So this was a clear a melanoma that should be removed as soon as possible. This was a 17 year old male with this very pigmented lesion. Have a look to the lesion. Get closer to this image. You see this whitish color on the center of the lesion. Well, you have the color, but the lesion is rather symmetric, but it has an atypical network. So you have a typical network, white color, and a little bit of symmetry. And it was removed because two of three points needs to be removed, and it was again a melanoma. So remember, two of them to send to be removed, a symmetry, a typical pigment network or the blue 
whitish vial. Focus asymmetry, a typical pigment network, and the blue whitish vial. The three point list, it's your time to work. I'd like you to think on these lesions and to tell yourself uh, what would you do. I present to you this case. Uh, this is an infant with this congenital lesion close to the lateral part of the left foot. If you get close to the image, you get this dermatoscopical uh, aspect. What do you think? Think of the three point list. Well, what do you think? There's a symmetry. Now it looks quite symmetrical. It's in a typical network. No, I don't see that typical here. Do we see any white or bluish colors? No, I don't. So this is a normal nevi that it has this crest aspect because it's located on palms and soles. It looks like that. So this does not need to be removed. Let's have a look to this other lesion. This is what we called before a typical clinically looking nevi, like the egg, the fried egg aspect with this more pigmented aspect on the center and they're not so pigmented on the borders and you can have a look to this lesion it looks rather symmetric even though the border is not so symmetrical but the structures inside they are well located we call this symmetry the network does not look so rare strange and the color it does not look whitish or blue so this was a dysplastic nevi or the clinically dysplastic looking nevi does not need to be removed. You'll see hundreds of them on your patients. Let's have a look to this other case. This was a younger girl. If you get close to the image, well, here you see a little bit of asymmetry. You see that the structures are not exactly the same at the top that in the lower part. If you get close to the lesion, you don't see any white or bluish lesions. You see here, well, we could say that symmetry or asymmetry sometimes are discussable. I would today rate this lesion as asymmetrical, but the reticle, the network, it's normal and the color, it's normal. So this was a, a nevus. This was a little bit older patient, was a 17 year old. If you get close to the image, you really don't like this aspect. You see a total asymmetry. You see different patterns of network. And in the center of the lesion, you can see this whitish aspect. So this was clearly with a asymmetry, with a, a typical network with white bluish vial to be removed. And this was clearly a melanoma. So it's not that difficult to work with this system. Let's do one again. What do you think clinically? Do you like this lesion? You don't like this lesion? Think it for yourself because we cannot raise hands here. We are not sitting all together. So I love to do this talk asking people to answer and some of them will suffer a little bit to answer in front of the others, but you can do it at home. How does it look to you? Think of the three points. What would you rate? of symmetry, think it for yourself. What would you rate of the network? Think it for yourself. Do you see blue or white? Think it for yourself. And here you've got the answer. It's clearly asymmetrical in structure. You have the network that it's totally different. Have a look to the up right. Oh, look at the left bottom and you see that the network it's totally asymmetrical and typical and you see also some white aspects on the left part of lesion so this was not a melanoma but needed to be removed because it was a regressing uh, nevus another case uh, on a very solar exposed uh, child have a look at the lesion think it for you is it asymmetrical what do you rate? Does it has a strange pattern on the network? What do you rate? Do you see strange colors in the in a part of it? 
Well, you see all three of them. So it needs to be removed. It was clearly asymmetrical. You see this black dot, it's located on the left of the lesion. You see this different pattern at the top and at the bottom of the lesion. And you see this uh, whitish and bluish. You see it, a little bit of white and blue in this lesion. So it needs to be clearly removed. Another case, a uh, very strange and big lesion, a little bit orange. Clinically, it looks a little bit orange and you get close to it. It looks a little bit different from the others. What would you rate as? Uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical, think it. What would you rate this? It is a, as an atypical network or not? Think it. Do you see white or blue colors? Well, it has just this asymmetry. So the network is normal, the color is normal, so it does not need to be removed. Another case, pigmented, very pigmented. It was, ooh, if you get close here, you have this aspect that it goes straight to your eyes. Now you are getting used to it. So you start having your own ideas with this recent method. You see these dark aspects, these white aspects. This um, does not look good at all. In fact, this was a melanoma and this needed to be removed as soon as possible. Another case. Hmm. What do you think? This is clearly asymmetric. No one will rate this as symmetrical. Have a look to the network and you see the different pattern of the network on one part and in the other. And can you see some white or bluish aspects? No, I don't see any blue aspects. So this is asymmetrical with an atypical network with normal color. So this is a typical mole. It was removed. It was good for the patient to be removed, even though in this case, this was not a melanoma. This clinically looked a little bit of a blue nevus. So you see this blue nevus, you get close to it and in fact, it looks blue. Do we see asymmetry? Not really. Do we see a strange network? Not really. Do we see blue? Yes, we do see blue. So this is a blue nevus. Does not need to be removed because there's nothing more than the bluish aspect. This uh, young adolescent presented with this congenital big lesion and the mother was suffering of the lesion. The mother said that it was growing. Uh, the adolescent was also growing, so sometimes you've got this uh, symmetrical growth. The adolescent grows at the same time as the lesion grows. We call it this harmonic growing of the congenital nevi. If you get close to the lesion, you can see that it looks, what do you think, it's symmetric or asymmetrical? Well, it looks rather symmetric to me. Do we see a typical network? Well, it all looks mostly the same. Do we see white colors? Yes, we do see white colors. So I would point this one. So you just have this white bluish veil, but it's not asymmetrical. It has now a typical network. So this is a congenital nevi. It is not at risk, does not need to be removed. Have a look to this uh, lady on the leg, a young, uh, young lady. Well, it looks like uh, a little bit of a drop of ink. Clearly, you see a different pattern in this one. Think it for yourself. Would you rate symmetric or asymmetrical? Think it for yourself. What do you think it's the network? Is it regular or irregular? Rate it for yourself. Do you see any white or bluish color? Think it. Well, I did not, but it looks like a little bit of regressive changes. So we removed that mole. It was a normal one with, with some regression. So it was good. Well, the question that I asked at the beginning, should then I buy a dermatoscope? Mm. I think uh, indeed it can help you in your daily practice. If you want to use the old style of uh, this type of lens, 
I think uh, you would be playing uh, being a doctor, but if you have the chance to use it properly. And on the left here, you have uh, my daughter that now she's on the medical school and I'm very proud of it. Thank you very much for your time and hope to see you next time, one in front of the other. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon, for your very nice and practical presentation. So we've come now to the Q&A part, the questions and answers part of the session. And I suggest that we start with some questions for the last speaker, for Ramon, and then go back in time with some questions for Suzanne and myself. The first question that arrived was, being a pediatrician with a general practice, what kind of dermatoscope should I buy? Do you have an idea? Can you comment on that? Yes, uh, I think that there's um, the most standard dermatoscopes now are from this uh, brand. It's called Dermlight, and they have three different levels of prices. So I would suggest to start with a cheap one of this brand. And if you think you are getting used to it and then you get more comfortable, maybe later you will need the option of getting one that can take images with it and so on. So maybe with a, I would say not more than 150 or 160 euros, you can get a good dermatoscope to work with most of the normal lesions you will be seeing. Okay. Um... Another question is, um, is it worth using a dermatoscope for other types of tumors than nevi? Yes, uh, they are not so common in, in pediatric dermatology, luckily, and they're not so specific signs. Uh, for instance, the first one of the first images I, I showed you, it was the Hashimoto Plitzkla uh, tumor, uh, histiocytosis uh, tumor, and they are not a typical um, sign for that. But uh, sometimes if you have to distinguish between um, pigmented or vascular lesions. Sometimes the dark lesions uh, can be really confused. So I think it can be also used for other type of tumors that are not pigmented tumors in the ETS. Yeah. And then um, being a pediatrician, we are not trained in using dermoscopy. Um, does it really help us or is it dangerous using this method? Yeah, this is a tough question. And in fact, uh, the first uh, papers that appeared on, on dermoscopy, uh, it was, this was a, an, a study made um, in non-trained dermatologists. If you have dermatologists of my age that are not trained and you give them a dermatoscope, they will uh, uh, start working worse than they did just using their eyes because you see things much closer and sometimes they look scary. So you start having a lot of doubts because clinically you know the idea. And then if you get too close, you get a little bit scared of that. So this can happen also obviously for pediatricians. If you are used to see like you have moles and you know when you don't like them and you send to, to your colleagues and then starting using the dermatoscope. But if you use this very easy system, the three point list, and if you, without being trained, you are a little bit systematic when approaching a mole, I think um, that changed a little bit and your scary feelings will not be real because you'll be able to apply science. And then your amount of precision on telling people what to do, They're telling parents when to run or not to run to the dermatologist or to the surgeon will change a lot. So I think even if you are not well trained, you can be systematic in order to be good using a dermatoscope. I agree with you. I think this is the most important part of your presentation, this easy way of doing to uh, to distinguish between something you have to uh, send to the dermatologist and things you can handle yourself. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe some questions for Suzanne now. Yeah. Um, Suzanne, when would you advise to refer to a pediatric dermatologist? Um, at least I would advise to contact a pediatric dermatologist 
is when a child with atopic dermatitis has uh, moderate uh, atopic dermatitis. Um, for a child with mild atopic dermatitis, it has a good response to the therapy. Um, I don't think uh, you, you have need to contact a dermatologist. But for the children with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, I would advise to refer or at least to contact or to see the child multidisciplinary with a pediatric dermatologist. Okay. Also because they have the, uh, the other diseases and it's getting complex for the child. Yeah, I see. Uh, another question that has been asked is, is it advisable to add a topical antibiotic to the treatment of atopic dermatitis? Yeah, that's a question that comes back every time. And as we don't exactly know what the position of the microbiome will be, um, so there are studies going on to investigate uh, whether when you change the microbiome, that might be a the treatment of atopic dermatitis. And we have to wait for the results of those studies. So I think until now, uh, when there is no sign of overgrow or impeticinization, you don't need to uh, uh, treat with topical corticosteroids. Um, but when you have skin or really systemic signs of uh, uh, secondary uh, infection, I would treat it with topical corticosteroids or even uh, quicker also with systemic uh, antibi antibiotics. Sorry, antibiotics, I mean, yeah. yeah. Would you say to avoid topical antibiotics and go directly to systemic antibiotics or both have a place in the treatment? When you have a child that is known with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis and has a lesion that is growing, uh, I would start systemic because most times you don't, uh, it, topical won't work. Yeah, and what's your idea about bleach baths, for example? Yeah, that might help. So you can also treat the child to to prevent the uh, um, the impeticinization. You can uh, treat the child two three times a week with a bleach bath or with uh, a betadine or chlorhexidine. Uh, you can all, all use them. Yeah. Okay. At least yeah, you, 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 uh, the the stuff or is overload will disappear. It will go down. Okay. So the overgrow. Yeah, I see. Another question is, uh, would you advise active elimination of allergens being part of the treatment of atopic dermatitis as sometimes is suggested in the treatment of asthma and so on? Yeah, so about 15 years ago, we advised, the advised diets in children with atopic dermatitis and uh, mattresses against the houses mite. But now there has been enough scientific evidence that it uh, will not uh, decrease the activity of the atopic dermatitis. So then you would advise that and the child would not get the proper treatment containing emollients and topical corticosteroids. So we do not advise that in the case of atopic dermatitis. Yeah. Okay. Does atopic dermatitis usually get better with increasing age? Is another question. Yeah, people think that, but I doubt that. And others also, because it's a genetic problem and uh, the skin goes to other, other uh, places on the body. So more to the folds. And then it looks like it disappears and it might be milder when the child is older, but often it also comes back in adolescence, so at the end 20s, it comes up often back, at least it's active again. And the other thing, most people have mild atopic dermatitis, and when they uh, change their lifestyle habits, like showering less long, less warm, treating their skin properly, that also uh, prevents the uh, exacerbations of atopic dermatitis. Okay. Another question, uh, people with atopic dermatitis, should they avoid any kind of vaccine? No, no, they should not avoid it. It might be that when you have atopic dermatitis and you get a vaccination, that you will have a more active eczema the week after it. But um, yeah, that's just because the, the immune system is active. 
that might also happen happen when you get a cold or something else or where you uh, ha ha you are not feeling well. So uh, that should not be a reason not to give a, a vaccination. That's more important. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. There was one question for me as well. And the question was, what is the difference between mastocytosis and mast cell activation syndrome? And um, there you can say that the diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome is based on three diagnostic criteria, being the presence of typical clinical signs of severe recurrent systemic mast cell activation, often in the form of anaphylaxis, then the involvement of mast cells documented by biochemical studies, for example, an increase in serum tryptase level. And a third criterion is the response of symptoms due uh, to therapy with mast cell stabilizing agents. And mast cell activation syndromes comprises three categories. A first category being primary clonal mast cell activation syndromes and their mastocytosis is part of this category. Then there's a second category being secondary mast cell activation syndrome with no kit mutations, but resulting from IgE dependent allergy or other hypersensitivity or immunological reactions. And a third category of idiopathic mast cell activation syndrome where there's no clonality and no trigger evidenced. So mastocytosis, as a short answer on the question, mastocytosis is part of the mast cell activation syndrome. There were no other questions on mastocytosis, just a few comments I want to make. Mastocytosis is a diagnosis which is often missed and you only see what you know. So if you are quite familiar with mastocytosis, then you will regularly see a child with cutaneous mastocytosis. I think I see maybe there is one more question. No, uh, there are no more questions. So this session is coming to an end. I would like to thank all of you for attending this session and Suzanne and Ramon for their contribution. We hope that you enjoyed it. Don't forget to join us for the second session on pediatric dermatology this afternoon at half past four. Have a good day, stay safe and healthy at home. Bye. Bye, thank you, bye.